he who wishes to test himself rigorously as to how he is related to the true aesthetic hearer or whether he belongs rather to the community of the socrato critical man has only to inquire sincerely concerning the sentiment with which he accepts the wonder represented on the stage whether he feels his historical sense which insists on strict psychological causality insulted by it whether with benevolent concession he as it were admits the wonder as a phenomenon intelligible to childhood but relinquished by him or whether he experiences anything else thereby for he will thus be enabled to determine how far he is on the whole capable of understanding myth that is to say the concentrated picture of the world which as abbreviature of phenomena cannot dispense with wonder it is probable however that nearly every one upon close examination feels so disintegrated by the critico-historical spirit of our culture that he can only perhaps make the former existence of myth credible to himself by learned means through intermediary abstractions without myth however every culture loses its healthy creative natural power it is only a horizon encompassed with myths which rounds off to unity a social movement it is only by myth that all the powers of the imagination and of the apollonian dream are freed from their random rovings the mythical figures have to be the invisibly omnipresent genii under the care of which the young soul grows to maturity by the signs of which the man gives a meaning to his life and struggles and the state itself knows no more powerful unwritten law than the mythical foundation which vouches for its connection with religion and its growth from mythical ideas let us now place alongside thereof the abstract man proceeding independently of myth the abstract education the abstract usage the abstract right the abstract state let us picture to ourselves the lawless roving of the artistic imagination not bridled by any native myth let us imagine a culture which has no fixed and sacred primitive seal but is doomed to exhaust all its possibilities and has to nourish itself wretchedly from the other cultures such is the present as the result of socratism which is bent on the destruction of myth and now the mythless man remains eternally hungering among all the bygones and digs and grubs for roots though he have to dig for them even among the remotest antiquities the stupendous historical exigency of the unsatisfied modern culture the gathering around one of countless other cultures the consuming desire for knowledge what does all this point to if not to the loss of myth the loss of the mythical home the mythical source let us ask ourselves whether the feverish and so uncanny stirring of this culture is aught but the eager seizing and snatching at food of the hungerer and who would care to contribute anything more to a culture which cannot be appeased by all it devours and in contact with which the most vigorous and wholesome nourishment is wont to change into quote, history and criticism end quote. we should also have to regard our german character with despair and sorrow if it had already become inextricably entangled in or even identical with this culture in a similar manner as we can observe it to our horror to be the case in civilized france and that which for a long time was the great advantage of france and the cause of her vast preponderance to wit this very identity of people and culture might compel us at the sight thereof to congratulate ourselves that this culture of ours which is so questionable 
has hitherto had nothing in common with the noble colonel of the character of our people. All our hopes, on the contrary, stretch out longingly toward the perception that beneath this restlessly palpitating civilized life and educational convulsion there is concealed a glorious, intrinsically healthy primeval power, which, to be sure, stirs vigorously only at intervals in stupendous moments, and then dreams on again, in view of a future awakening. It is from this abyss that the German Reformation came forth, in the choral hymn of which the future melody of German music first resounded, so deep, courageous, and soul-breathing. So exuberantly good and tender did this chorale of Luther sound, as the first Dionysian luring call, which breaks forth from dense thickets at the approach of spring. To it responded with emulative echo the solemnly wanton procession of Dionysian revelers, to whom we are indebted for German music, and to whom we shall be indebted for the rebirth of german myth i know that i must now lead the sympathizing and attentive friend to an elevated position of lonesome contemplation where he will have but few companions and i call out encouragingly to him that we must hold fast to our shining guides the greeks for the rectification of our aesthetic knowledge we previously borrowed from them the two divine figures each of which sways a separate realm of art, and concerning whose mutual contact and exaltation we have acquired a notion through Greek tragedy. Through a remarkable disruption of both these primitive artistic impulses, the ruin of Greek tragedy seemed to be necessarily brought about, with which process a degeneration and a transmutation of the greek national character was strictly in keeping summoning us to earnest reflection as to how closely and necessarily art and the people myth and custom tragedy and the state have coalesced in their bases the ruin of tragedy was at the same time the ruin of myth until then the Greeks had been involuntarily compelled immediately to associate all experiences with their myths. Indeed, they had to comprehend them only through this association, whereby even the most immediate present necessarily appeared to them subspecie eterni, and in a certain sense, as timeless. Into this current of the timeless, however, the state as well as art plunged in order to find repose from the burden and eagerness of the moment. And a people, for the rest also a man, is worth just as much only as its ability to impress on its experiences the seal of eternity. For it is thus, as it were, desecularized and reveals its unconscious inner conviction of the relativity of time and of the true, that is, the metaphysical significance of life. The contrary happens when a people begins to comprehend itself historically and to demolish the mythical bulwarks around it, with which there is usually connected a marked secularization a breach with the unconscious metaphysics of its earlier existence, in all ethical consequences. Greek art, and especially Greek tragedy, delayed above all the annihilation of myth. It was necessary to annihilate these also to be able to live detached from the native soil, unbridled in the wilderness of thought, custom, and action. Even in such circumstances, this metaphysical impulse still endeavors to create for itself a form of apotheosis, weakened, no doubt, in the Socratism of science urging to life. But on its lower stage, this same impulse led only to a feverish search, which gradually merged into a pandemonium of myths and superstitions, 
accumulated from all quarters, in the midst of which, nevertheless, the Hellene sat with a yearning heart till he contrived, as Graculus, to mask his fever with Greek cheerfulness and Greek levity, or to narcotize himself completely with some gloomy oriental superstition. We have approached this condition in the most striking manner since the reawakening of the Alexandro-Roman antiquity in the fifteenth century, after a long, not easily describable interlude. On the heights there is the same exuberant love of knowledge, the same insatiate happiness of the discoverer, the same stupendous secularization, and together with these a homeless roving about an eager intrusion at foreign tables, a frivolous deification of the present, or a dull, senseless estrangement, all subspecies seculi of the present time. Which same symptoms lead one to infer, the same defect at the heart of this culture, the annihilation of myth, it seems hardly possible to transplant a foreign myth with permanent success, without dreadfully injuring the tree through this transplantation, which is perhaps occasionally strong enough and sound enough to eliminate the foreign element after a terrible struggle, but must ordinarily consume itself in a languishing and stunted condition or in sickly luxuriance. Our opinion of the pure and vigorous kernel of the German being is such that we venture to expect of it, and only of it, this elimination of forcibly ingrafted foreign elements, and we deem it possible that the German spirit will reflect anew on itself. Perhaps many a one will be of opinion that this spirit must begin its struggles with the elimination of the Romanic element for which it might recognize an external preparation and encouragement in the victorious bravery and bloody glory of the late war, but must seek the inner constraint in the emulative zeal to be forever worthy of the sublime protagonists on this path, of Luther as well as our great artists and poets. But let him never think he can fight such battles without his household gods without his mythical home, without a, quote, restoration, end quote, of all German things. And if the German should look timidly around for a guide to lead him back to his long-lost home, the ways and paths of which he knows no longer, let him but listen to the delightfully luring call of the Dionysian bird which hovers above him, and would fain point out to him the way thither. End of chapter 23. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.